I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible Translation. Colossians 3.18 to chapter 4, verse 1. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter towards them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they won't become discouraged. Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched, as people pleasers, but work wholeheartedly, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it from the heart, as something done for the Lord, and not for people, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done, and there is no favoritism. Masters, deal with your slaves justly and fairly, since you know that you too have a master in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Well, again, welcome uh, for those of you who have since walked in. Uh, my name is Mitchell. I have the honor of serving as one of the elders here at Redeemer Fellowship. It's a pleasure to have you here this morning. Uh, humor me a bit of an autobiographical flashback, if you will. Right after I finished my undergraduate degree, I was footloose and fancy free, as the saying goes, single, and thought, China seemed a pretty good landing place for a few years. Uh, I applied for it and was given a position at the Beijing Institute of Technology as a, quote, foreign expert. My area of expertise, you ask? Well, speaking English. After 20 plus years of study and practice, I got pretty good at it. So BIT offered me a job teaching classes that really had little to no effect on student transcripts in a subject most of them were pretty good at already and already motivated to learn. It was a piece of cake. And even if I hadn't told you already, my relatively consistent appeals to grammar in understanding the biblical text should have tipped you off on my love of English and spoken word. I love a good book. I love the turn of a phrase, the pace of a narrative, the details, the manner in which things are communicated, the subtleties of under communicating, the clarity or opacity of over communicating Etymology, linguistics, hermeneutics, homiletics, all of it. Sign me up. Uh, but one of my favorite English lessons each semester in China dealt with the ever-elusive idiom. You know, those phrases that are so embedded in cultural history and context that they make no sense, literally, when they're translated. All thumbs. What in the world? Throw in the towel? Two left feet? piece of cake. Trying to teach college students the finer points and usages of these phrases could be equal parts grueling and hilarious. But I actually found that the most consistent way idioms would stick in their minds is when the phrase would become personal. When they were able to see or feel the idea as it related to their own particular everyday context, it made more sense. All thumbs clicks when you know the pain and frustration of attempting to fix something, but you only make it worse as your lack of coordination takes over. And then the idiom really starts to hit home. Before we come to the implications laid out in our text today, let me remind us of how we got here. Paul does not simply throw out these commands to the church in Colossae in bullet points as if he was making a list to grab some things from the supermarket. We're at the end of the third chapter in his letter, and he has said a lot so far. He starts by giving thanks to God for the way in which this church had come to know the gospel. He gives thanks for the fruit and growth among them and prays that they might continue to grow. He prays that they might walk in a manner worthy of the Lord in all things, he has pointed time and again to the centrality of Christ, not only in our lives, but in the very cosmos he created, and now more specifically in the life of the church. He reminds them of the reconciliation that is theirs through Christ's physical death. He reminds them of what it had personally cost him to carry this message of hope and life 
and forgiveness. He combats false teaching among them that they would that would cheapen and lessen the gospel work among them. He reminds them that they have died to the elements of this world, that they have been raised with Christ and are hidden in him, that they are to put to death what belongs to their earthly nature. He reminds them that they are there is now no Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. And most recently, we saw that as people of the new creation, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, as people who are his, that we are to put on new clothes, namely compassion and kindness, humility and gentleness and patience, that they are to bear with one another and forgive one another their grievances, just as the Lord had forgiven each of them. He says, you are also to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. In whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Friends, this is a good reminder. And it's right that we remind ourselves of all of this as Paul, through and under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, is about to ask some very specific things of us. Things that quite honestly make very little sense to the world around us. He's going to press hard into our beloved private lives. As F.F. Bruce put it, it is in the closest and most familiar relationships of daily living that the reality of one's Christian profession will normally be manifest or made real, if at all. In essence, this is where our new identity in Christ and the instructions on how we are to see and treat each other really start to hit home. Paul takes the heart behind chapter 3, verses 12 to 7, and presses it into family life. Our sermon title today is simply Domestic Implications. And our outline comes in three parts, centering really on the most basic and core of human relationships. Paul's structure is unmistakably clear here in this section. He goes rapid fire staccato on us. First, we'll see the implications for the Lordship of Christ in marriage. Next, we'll see the implications in parenting. Finally, we'll see its implications in the workplace, which in Paul's day and time centered on family owned businesses. Each of these sections comes in a part A, and then a part B. First up, we'll look at the Lordship of Christ in marriage. Here at the beginning, I am asking for your patience and understanding, as each of these sections could very well be their own sermons, if not sermon series. There's a lot I'm going to leave unsaid today. The topics are enormous, and they're all taken together one right after the other. The feeling that I'm not doing them justice has hung over my head all week. Know that I've left so much unsaid, much of which needs to be said. My main goal today is to see these verses in their context, to see what Paul has called us to and to see how we might see the implications of his teaching in our everyday lives. And let me just pause for a moment and say that I understand just how polarizing these topics can be, how sensitive you might be to these issues for very real reasons. The brokenness of our world is always before us. We long for the day when Christ will make all things new 
And yet, that day has not come in its fullness. You and I are both very much still in the struggle to put to death our own sin? Putting on compassion and kindness, bearing with each other in love and forgiveness is hard. It takes time. Letting the word of Christ dwell richly among us, and more specifically in me, takes time. A lifetime, in fact. But as we walk through these verses, ask yourself how the clothes we see in chapters 3, verse 12 through 17, might look in each of these relationships in your life. If there was ever a sermon you heard where I'm not talking to the person next to you, today's it. Think about how these implications work out in your life. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, in the context of chapter 3. So here we go. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. In researching what exactly Paul means by this imperative, uh, it's pretty clear, actually. The Greek behind it simply says, wives, submit to your husbands. There's not a lot of nuance there, actually. Literally, he says, wives, submit, or sorry, he says, women, submit yourselves to your men. But given the context of the following verses and the broader use of these terms, it covers married people. Scholars see the relationship in view. Paul is addressing wives. Likewise, research then on what exactly he's asking the wives to do here also came without very many stark revelations. It seems the Greek word hupatasso means to order under. In the Greek of the Old Testament, it's most consistently used in a secular military context. Here in the New Testament, we see it employed in a variety of relationships. All believers are to submit to God, Hebrews 12, James 4, and to his law, Romans 8. The church is to submit to Christ, Ephesians 5. Jews are to submit to God's righteousness, Romans 10. Humans in general are to submit to the governing authorities over them, Romans 13, Titus 3, 1 Peter 2. Christians in particular are to submit to their leaders, 1 Corinthians 16. Slaves are to submit to their masters, Titus 2. Young men are to submit to older men, 1 Peter 5. Children are to submit to their parents, Luke 2. Wives are to submit to husbands, here Colossians 3, but also Ephesians 5, Titus 2, 1 Peter 3. Lastly, Paul exhorts us all generally to submit to one another in Ephesians 5, just before calling on wives to submit to their husbands specifically. The payoff in all this background digging came by way of seeing uh, this call for wives to submit against its ancient Greco-Roman cultural context. What would have been more typical in that day and age would have been a direct address to the head of the household to retain order in his own home. Thereby, he would have been called to keep his wife in line, as it were. Here, Paul addresses the wives directly. And not only that, who, I ask, is the active, willing participant in this command? It's not the husbands, but again the wives. Paul is asking them to submit themselves. Husbands are not to demand this of them. And they are certainly not to force it upon them. In addressing the wives directly, Paul is asking them, albeit with an imperative, to order themselves voluntarily under their husbands. The last way in which this command deviates from the cultural norm is by evoking the name of the Lord. Again, Jewish and Stoic writers of the day had written their own household treatises with some interesting parallels. To be sure, but by adding the phrase, as is fitting in the Lord, Paul says everything. He's not just adding a bit of Christian fairy dust to, sec to secular norms. He's providing the only right basis forever, submitting to each other, much less wise to husbands. That basis is none other than their new found life in the kingdom of God. The manner of their submission notes G.K. Bill, to their husbands is to be influenced by their conforming their lives to the humble and sacrificial lifestyle of Jesus, together with striving for love and unity and peace 
in Christ, as well as living in subjection to Christ's word in Scripture. The tension, then, as we live in the here and now, is that Christ's kingdom has not come in its consummated fullness, where they will neither marry nor be given in marriage, Luke 20. So for now, Paul is asking wives to live within the structure of the family as they clothe themselves with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience, especially for their husbands. Who are up next? Guys, husbands, love your wives. Don't be bitter toward them. Where wives are simply given one directive to follow, husbands are given two. And we'll take each in turn. It should be noted at the outset that while the manner and reason in which Paul asks wives to submit to their husbands was countercultural, it was still to be expected in the broader Greco Roman world. Husbands being called on to love their wives would have been unheard of. Seen as the main authority of his household, the husband was called upon to retain order in his household with utter surety. Love was a word to scoff at. Not so in the Christian household, Paul says. So three weeks ago, as we looked at the section right before this, I offered a definition for love. What's I'll do here again? To recognize, delight in, and seek all the lore, the good in another's life. To recognize, delight in, and seek all the more the good in another's life. This is what Paul is asking husbands to do and look and see in their wives. It is what F.F. F. Bruce calls his active and unceasing care for her well-being. That is to say, if he is called to love his wife, it has been his delight and obligation to ensure, as far as it depends upon him, that his wife's needs are being met, physical, emotional, spiritual. Back to G.K. Bill, he says, ironically, just as Christ did, so also the husband expresses his authority through sacrificially giving himself for his wife, especially by considering her needs before his own. The husband's love is the imitation of Christ and especially love for his wife as his own body, which means that the husband will consider the interests of his wife above his own. Secondly, Paul gives the command to not be bitter toward them. The difficulty here is in knowing whether it is the husband who is not to be bitter or it is or he is not to act in a way that makes the wife bitter. So, uh, pop quiz for all the youth who attend Thursday evenings. No, whenever they see an either or, it is quite possible I have just set up what? False dichotomy. Sure, could be. Uh, it could be either. It probably most certainly isn't both. That's just not the way language works. So I'll tease them both out and let you decide. The translation of the CSB, the Christian Center Bible here, goes for option A, which is, uh, they'll be better yourselves, uh, but is not as helpful as I would like. So I'll appeal to the uh, English Standard Version, ESV, which translates this portion as, do not be harsh with them. So it's the man, the husband, who is acting in an embittered way by using the harshness of his tone and physicality to express his authority. But as we saw in previous sermon on Colossians, it would be utterly inconsistent for a husband to be compassionate and kind and gentle and husband and patient and bearing with his wife and forgiving her and doing so in a harsh way. Option B, then, would be just as true. Husbands, don't exercise any authority you might have in your home in such a way that your wife feels steamrolled every time a decision needs to be made. Consider your wife's needs, desires, wishes, personality. 
For heaven's sake, consult her and decide together as often as you can so that when the time comes and you're called upon to make a decision to the right or to the left, and that decision falls squarely on your shoulders, your wife will know that you are acting in love and in deference for her. How are we doing? Things hit, hitting home yet? Still thinking through how to live out Paul's call to clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness and gentleness and humility and patience? I hope so. We're moving on. Kids, you'll have next. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. It's kind of fun having my kids right up here. I like it to say this. Except for Silas. Remind him of this him later. It turns out the Greek word here is pretty broad and can cover a wide range of ages. Not just those who would be hanging out in Redeemer Kids right now or those who come to game night later or those who join for the youth group on Thursday evenings. In the Greco-Roman world, you were a child as long as you were in your parents' household. As long as you were eating their food, living under their roof, letting them pay your school fees, things like that. As we mentioned previously, and we'll point out again in another section, children here are actually being addressed in their own right. And whether Paul has in mind adult believing children in the congregation or younger children who might believe the gospel themselves is not entirely clear. The important point is to see that he is talking to you directly and not admonishing your parents to make you obey. In Paul's day and age, again, this would have been surprising. He's addressing you as responsible, active participants within the life and family of the church family and family itself. Should also notice the shift in word here. Children are not called to submit to their parents or be in submission, however your translation goes about it. They're called to obey. Paul's reminding you that while you are under the care and responsibility and authority of your parents, it's in your best interest to do what they ask of you. Now, I should go without saying at this point that were your parents to actively and knowingly ask you to act in a sinful manner, you can in good conscience disobey. Likewise, if they themselves are acting in a harmful manner towards you, please let somebody know. Once you're on your own, providing for yourself, creating a life in a household of your own, your relationship to your parents shifts. In a very real sense, you no longer need to ask your parents for permission. You do, however, need to continually honor them for the role they played in your life, for the way they nurtured you, for the way they brought you up, hopefully, to know Christ as Lord and Savior. And when this shift happens, your relationship to your parents will change. They'll become more of a confidant or a consultant or even a friend. So going back to Colossians 2, 12 to 17, for those of you who are still under your parents' roof and still in that time when you're called to obey, what does it mean to put on compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience? First of all, it means this is how you treat any brothers or sisters the good Lord might have given you, older or younger. Secondly, know this. Being a parent requires a lot from your parents. It's an enormous responsibility. There are days when your parents will feel like complete failures. Nothing like the parents they had hoped to be when they were perhaps looking at you for the first time. And what Paul is asking you is to be the kind of child that makes parenting a delight. You also will have bad days. And yet, this is why we bear with one another and forgive each other. Just as Christ forgave us even within the family. Next up, fathers, do not exasperate your children so they won't become discouraged. In the section on marriage, both the husband and wife are addressed. Here in the parenting section, the children are addressed, but not the parents. It seems Paul wants to sit down and have a chat with the dads. 
in particular. I'll be in a short one. This is not to say that he's completely neglecting mothers. The word here translated father can actually denote both parents to a degree, so mothers take note as well. And yet the direct address is towards the dads in the room. And what is Paul's one and only encouragement to them? It's hard to tell, actually. A short list of Bible translations goes like this. Do not embitter your children. Do not aggravate your children. The first one was the NIV, then the NLT. Do not provoke your children, ESV, New King James. Do not provoke your children to anger, King James. Do not antagonize your children, New American Standard. Do not exasperate your children here in the CSB or the legacy. Don't be hard on your children, contemporary English. Embitter, aggravate, provoke, antagonize, exasperate. It seems Paul is making clear the idea that as a father who will have authority and physical prowess over his children, you are not to exercise those advantages in a way that harms your children. Don't be so unreasonable that your children lose heart and give up on the idea that they will ever please you. Don't make it impossible for them. Positively, what had God called you to? You are to help them grow, nurturing them in the fear and admonition of the Lord, teaching them, loving them, delighting in them, providing a place of safety for them so that they will feel secure in your love just as they should find security and rest in our heavenly Father's arms. But above all, show them what it means to live a life of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. You are their teacher. You are their guide. You are the one they see day in and day out. You are the one that will pattern their life after, whether you realize it or not, whether they want it or not. And the more grace they see displayed in your life, the more compassion they see coming from you towards them and others, the more they know and experience the kindness of their earthly father, the more they watch you live a life of humility and deference towards each other, the more they see your hand as gentle, productive, and life-giving, and not harsh or destructive. The more they see patience in you, fathers. The more they see these things cultivated in your own life, the more you are making the path straight to their heavenly Father. Yes. Do you save them? No! Is their salvation dependent upon you? No. Are you called to point them to Jesus? Yes. And while you teach them the scriptures, may the Holy Spirit work in you to grow this fruit so that one day your kids might believe the miraculous, the seemingly impossible and say that poor and wretched and sinful though I am, I know that God is doing a good work in me. I've seen it happen before in my own home, and I know that God can do the same in me. Parents, how are we doing? Kids, things hitting home still? Because we're moving on. Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only when being watched as people pleasers, but work wholeheartedly, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the reward of inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever he wrong he has done, and there is no favoritism. Here we have the longest segment of this whole section. While the other folks are addressed with a single command or two, slaves are given the full treatment. At the outset, know that the Bible does not endorse slavery and ultimately sees it as incompatible with kingdom principles, both in its ancient form 
and modern forms. By encouraging believers, both slaves and masters, in the way he does, Paul undercuts the institution as a whole. That being said, if you or someone you know is being held in a position of servitude against their will, please let us know. It wasn't just an ancient problem. So Paul's position and demeanor in addressing the slaves or servants among the Colossians the Greek word can go either way, gives us an exit, an able cause for reflection as we consider our own jobs with our own task sheets, management flows, bosses, deadlines, requirements. In particular, he speaks to the modern worker and the heart behind our motivations in work. As we mentioned before, this appeal here in section 3a is the longest and the one Paul qualifies the fullest. There are three points he makes in appeal. He encourages them in their manner of service. He encourages them in their future and lasting reward. And then he encourages them to consider the final judgment. In all three, Paul's ultimate message is this. While it is true that your work, you work for an earthly master, a flesh and blood master, you must remember that it is your heavenly master that you truly serve. He is the one who will ultimately take into account all that you have done. So while there's much to be said in regards to all three of these points, allow me to focus in on one in particular, just one phrase. He says to them, you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. Can you imagine for a moment being a slave your whole life? life. And hearing that for the first time, can you imagine the difference it would make in your outlook on life to know that while you are destitute and oppressed here in this life, what awaits for you is something altogether different and glorious. An inheritance was the last thing a slave could ever expect or hope for. The inheritance was for the child. The inheritance stayed in the family. But now, now you have been afforded an inheritance that doesn't rust, that can't be stolen or taxed. It is kept safe, safe, purchased and waiting for you. You've been invited to the table. The shepherd found you. You are his and he has put the ring on your finger. So now, in this in-between, already but not yet, while Christ's kingdom is yet to come, your work, you work with joy in your Father's world, knowing that He delights in seeing you cultivate and build and tend and keep His creation. Even if your earthly master or boss doesn't. Lastly, masters, deal with your slaves justly and fairly, since you know that you too have a master in heaven. Like much that has been discussed in the other sections, this statement by Paul would have been utterly incomprehensible to the outside world. Aristotle literally said in his Nicomachean Ethics, justice between a master and a slave, there is no such thing as injustice in the absolute sense towards what is one's own and his property. But here, Paul calls for the equal treatment, fair treatment, dignifying the worker or slave unlike his Greco-Roman counterparts. And what is his reasoning? Masters, you don't sit at the top of the org chart. CEO, business owner, managers, bosses, you will give an account for the way you treat those entrusted to you. You have a responsibility to care for God's creature especially those made in his image. So in closing, let me see if you're paying attention. Kiddos in the room, help me out here. Who's referenced more than anyone else in this passage? Certainly anyone who falls into the three categories of husband, father, master might be an obvious answer. The guys in the room perhaps, but no. 
And yet who's mentioned seven times in these seven verses? To whom are we to find our delight? To whom do we long to please? To whom do we work and toil and labor? To whom does belong these things both in heaven above and earth below? You see, as we have walked through the book of Colossians and will continue to do for a couple more weeks, what is obvious and apparent is this. Knowing Christ Jesus as Lord fundamentally changes the way you see the world, changes the way you see your spouse or your kids, changes the way you see your boss or your coworkers, changes the way you do your schoolwork or your chores or any task on your to-do list. It changes the way you relate to one another. It changes things, but most especially in the home. Paul's not giving these instructions because they're easy or natural or in line with current or even ancient culture. He's giving these instructions to those of us who have one foot in this world and one foot planted and pointing to the world to come when all of this will pass away and be made new and glorious. Doug Moo of Wheaton College summarizes it this way. The new family of God gave believers their fundamental identity. But the spiritual family did not eliminate the continuing significance of the physical family and the relations appropriate to its smooth functioning. Colossians 3 here gives guidance for the way Christians are to bring all of life under the Lordship of Christ. Friends, may it be so of us.